Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, we're continuing with our study of the book of Job. In fact, tonight, uh, we, we expect to conclude the study. We're going to look at chapter 41 and 42, the last two chapters of Job. Now, if, if you have not watched this study from the beginning, I hope you will go back and watch it all. Uh, uh, it's all the previous studies are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so they are available if you'd like to go back and watch it. Uh, all right, um, I'll ask uh, Brother Stephen uh, to uh, introduce himself before we get started. Hey, everybody. Brother Stephen here once again. Again, looking forward you know, to finishing this study up, and of course, another night of just fellowship learning and, of course, spreading the gospel when the time comes. All right. I, I'm hoping to get through this uh, last two chapters a little bit faster than usual because I don't think it's going to be that necessary to go into in great depth and then have some time left in the end to kind of re, kind of uh, rediscuss the entire book of Job briefly. So let's. Uh, I'm a KJV first, just so we'll read it first in the KJV and then look at it in the Amplified. Forty-one, verse one. Canst thou draw a Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through, through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? I'm going to stop after verse 5 there, and uh, uh, I should tell you, of course, this is for the last several chapters, God has been lecturing Job and, uh, and giving Job perspective about who he is and who God is. <laughs> Showing, asking him a series of questions like these uh, so that uh, Job has to continue saying, no, 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 I, I'm not capable of doing those things. But, but of course, God is able to do these things, does, does do these things. Uh, I'll read it in the Amplified real quick. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope made of rushes into his nose or pierce his jaw through the hook? Will he, make, will he make many supplications to you, begging to be spared? Or will he speak soft words to you to coax you to treat him kindly? Will he make a covenant or arrangement with you? Will you take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you bind him and put him on a leash for your maidens? Now, of course, Leviathan is a giant sea creature <laughs> so uh that you got to understand who he's talking about there okay um brother what's your reaction to all that i'm really glad you said that because i was getting really confused and about Le Le leviathan when it came to this i'm like leviathan at first i thought it was just a person or something or like of like a country and then but now when you say it's this is a giant sea creature and then it's talking about Apparently, just being able to get him by plain fishing. I mean, that's what I'm assuming is going on in verse 41 here. You know, I guess it just shows that, you know, Job just, you know, can't, you know, pull off something like this. So, again, just a continuation of, you know, again, even though Job, you know, was righteous, still the comparison between, you know, him and God at this point. Um, in a way... God has uh, gone in this, you use the word tirade uh, to describe God's lecturing Job the last few chapters. It is a tirade. It's going on and on, and he's lecturing him. In a way, someone might think he's belittling Job, but I guess he is belittling him because he, he wants Job to understand and admit how little he is compared to God. He's nothing. 
So he's giving example after example of these things that he can do, but Job could never do them. Uh, and Job, of course, is going to gain perspective. Um, now, I'll go on. Verse 6 says, Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? <laughs> well, I'll read it in the Amplified just so that we can see if there's anything else we can get out of that. But that's pretty plain English, I think. He says in verse 6 in the Amplified, Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle with him. You will not do such an ill-advised thing again. Behold, his assailant's hope and expectation of defeating Leviathan is false. Uh, will not one be overwhelmed even at the sight of him? No one is so fierce and foolhardy that he dares to stir up Leviathan. Who then is he who can stand before me? or dares to contend with me, the beast creator. Whew. Man. Brother, what do you say about that? That's very deep right there. Because now you, you, at first you're just take, you know, using the comparison of him and the sea creature. And now you go, as I've always said, no creation is better than its creator. Then you take it and put it against God himself. You know, it's just, it's just a ridiculous difference, and um, it's just – just having to use an earthly, I guess, comparison, you know, just to show, I guess, just continuing to show Job how small he is, you know, in comparison to him, because then, you know, God's even greater than this, you know, by far. So it's just – it's insane. All right, I was muted there for a second. Is that uh, Brother uh, Stephen there, CA two way? He joined us. Um, show and broadcast. Let me see. Okay, there you are. Is that Brother uh, Stephen, CA two way? Yeah. Hi, Brother Luke. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm fantastic. Hi. I'm glad you could could join us. Uh, I don't know if you know the other Stephen. It's going to be really easy for me because I just have to remember Stephen and I'm going to be right with whoever I'm talking to. <laughs> yeah, bless you, brother. Yes. Um, yeah, I've just joined you, so I'm just catching up to where you're at. Um, I'm just going to be listening on the side for a minute. Look, it's lovely to see you again. I'm glad to be here. Bless you, brother. All right. Very good. I will uh, will continue and uh, I, I'm going to ask you for your response as we go along if you feel like... Uh, uh, sharing with us. Okay, so the important thing here is that, uh, yeah, um, Brother Stephen Rivers uh, said that this, he, he's always made the point, and I, I've heard him say it many times, that uh, nothing in creation can equal to the, be equal to the Creator. The Creator is always greater than the creation, and that's the point that he makes there in verse 10. Look how great Leviathan is. You, you're, you, you must be scared to death of Leviathan, and yet I'm his master. I'm his creator. Don't mess with me. <laughs> okay, I'll go back to the uh, uh, KJV for verse 11. Um, Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? What, whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. Uh, let me read that in the Amplified very quickly, verse 11 through 15. Um, 
Who has get first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Who can have a claim against me who made the unmastered beast? I will not keep silence concerning his limbs, nor his mighty strength, nor his orderly frame. Who can penetrate or strip off his outer armor? Who can come to his jaws with a double bridle? Who can open the doors, jaws of his face? Around his open jaws and teeth there is terror. His strong scales are his pride, bound together as with a tight seal. Uh, so he's asking the question over and over, who, who can do this? Who can do this? Who can do this? Can you do it, Job? And of course, Job, Brother Stephen, Brother Luke, we, we, we'd have to say, fall our face and say, no, no, we can't do it. It, 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 it just we're we're put in our place. We're 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 shown how little we are uh, in the universe. I'm not even like a speck of dust in the universe. I'm so tiny. But my joy is that as small as I am in the universe, God became a man and died for me. That's how much God loves me and you. So in spite of our tiny little. Um, uh, existence God values us but he's given Job perspective and says can you do it who can do it who can do this only I could do it only God can do it let me get see if you, you want to respond to, to, to those verses I don't think I need to really put on any additional comment I think you got it pretty good Okay, well, let me go on then. Verse uh, uh, 16 in the KJV. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his kneesings a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. It's getting interesting. Okay, in the Amplified, uh, verse 16, one is, he's talking about his scales. He says, one is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be separated. His sneezes flash forth light, and his eyes are like the reddish eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go burning torches, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils smoke goes forth, as from a boiling pot, and as from burning rushes. So this is a fire-breathing animal spewing fire out of its nostrils. What do you say about that? Sounds like an ancient type of dragon. Description of a dragon, an old English type fire-breathing dragon. And, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we, we, we lost uh, Brother Stephen. He must have lost his connection. I think he'll be back in a minute. You're right. Uh, and and uh, so people think that a dragon is a mythological creature, uh, and yet we see uh, we see so many ancient uh, artifacts of drawings and sculptures and and uh, stories of these dragons, uh, and they weren't even that ancient. Even in times when uh, I think a, a story about King Arthur and these these knights and they were dra dragon slayers. Uh, that is that is not so ancient at all, uh, and so is it true, uh, brother brother uh, Stephen Rivers? Uh, we're talking about this is describing some fire breathing creature that's giant. What would you call a creature like that, brother Stephen Rivers? Sounds like you know what is as you know a lot of people would call it. Sounds like a dragon. You know, if it's going to be, you know, a big fire breathing, you know, you know, creature thingy. But uh, yeah, sorry about leaving the call. Got a like had a phone call come over through this thing. 
All right, yes. Um, um, brother uh, Stephen uh, C.A. Tua, he, uh, he also identified it as a dragon. And I, and I said that, well, dragons have been, um, people believe in dragons throughout all of history. There's all kinds of ancient drawings, and, and uh, just like of, of dinosaurs, but also of dragons. A, a, a dinosaur and a dragon is the same thing, but the distinction between a dragon, of course, is we associate it as being fire-breathing. Now, I saw a YouTube video a few years ago. I'm sure we, we could you know, search it on YouTube and find it easily. Uh, there is some kind of a insect creature that actually breathes fire today. Um, and the idea of, of uh, an animal breathing fire, uh, exhaling fire, uh, seems like it's, it's some fantasy thing that someone must have just dreamed up. And yet, when you look at all the creatures uh, uh, on land and deep in the oceans, when we really examine them, the variety of them, it's so spectacular, it boggles our mind the more we learn and discover new ones, how they're designed, all these different ways, and the ability for an animal to breathe fire. Uh, people find that hard to believe. I don't at all. I've actually seen it in these insects, as I've said. Uh, so the Leviathan is a dragon, but it's also a sea creature. A sea creature that has the ability to breathe fire like a, a dragon does. Uh, anything else before I go on to the next verses? Just one quick comment, brother. Um, it's just a really interesting when I'm just, uh, reading this uh, through once more, and it sounds like a really, you know, some people sort of see sort of mythological dragons as sort of evil and not very good, and that some are portrayed as good, but some, most of them are. Uh, of see, but the sort of interpretation I'm getting for this is a, this is a very really good sort of thing to have um, encouragement. Yeah. Uh, no additional comment as of right now. Okay, I uh, uh, I'm not hearing anything about like it's a bad evil creature in this in this chapter here. Uh, it's uh, it's bad though if you get in its way, I guess, and if you try to capture it. But God could put on a put it on a leash, as He's saying. Can you? Can you? How does He phrase it there in the in the very end there, verse twenty? He says, uh, "Out of His nostrils going smoke, as out of the seething pot or cauldron." Uh huh. Oh yeah. Here in verse thirteen, it says, "Who can come to His jaws with a double bridle?" In other words, put a bridle on him like a like a, you bridle a horse. <laughs> you know, could you do that? Well, God could do that if he wanted to. He could bridle this this uh, giant creature. All right, uh, back to the KJV. I'm going to read uh, verse uh, 21. Um, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength. And sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. Yeah, I'm going to need the Amplified to understand some of that here. Go back... Verse 21 in the Amplified says, His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes forth from his mouth. In Leviathan's neck resides strength, and dismay and terror dance before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together, firm on him and immobile when he moves. His heart is as hard as a stone, indeed as solid as a lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid because of the crashing. They are bewildered. So it is um, definitely a uh, magnificent creature. Uh, in, the, in the previous chapters, he was talking about behemoth, I think it was. This is Leviathan. In verse 39 and 40, I think he was talking about behemoth, if I remember the name of it. And that was a giant land creature. 
who says his tail is like a cedar. And to me, that has to be a dinosaur. It has to be something like the dinosaur we think of as a, a brontosaurus, something like that, that we think of having the long neck, but it has a tail that's like a giant tree. And uh, someone, the translators, they th they're starting to say it's a hippopotamus. <laughs> hippopotamus doesn't have a giant tail like like Behemoth uh, in Job is described. But I think in both these chapters, in, in, in Job, the end of Job here, it's describing this giant land creature, what I, what I see as a dinosaur, and this giant sea creature, which is a dinosaur or a dragon, and saying, look how great they are. I created them. You're afraid of them. You, you could, could you create them? Could you control them? I, I can control them, create them, destroy them. I can do whatever I want. So he, again, Job is really getting some perspective here. Um, all right, before I go on, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, it's just it's just a continuation of the same point. Just continuing to show just the mightiness of this, which continues to show how mighty you know God is. So again, just more perspective, you know, putting Job in his place. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but your icons are the same. You both have uh, crosses for icons there. Isn't that interesting? And you're both named Stephen. Well, <laughs> I did notice that. Just a little, just a little interesting thing. Uh, we talked about dinosaurs in earlier when we talked about the stegos uh, the brontosaurus, or the uh, in in the last chapter. But this could also be describing a dinosaur, because I was reading a very interesting article a few weeks ago about um, scientists think that some dinosaurs might have been able to breathe some form of fire as a defense mechanism. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's just an interesting little thing I'll put out there. Yeah, um, as I said earlier, I don't know if you heard this part of it, but uh, uh, a few years ago I, I did see, I think I have this video saved on my uh, playlist, uh, Science God in the Bible. And it's a, it's a, a video that shows a fire-breathing insect that lives today. <clears throat> and explains how, how this insect is able to do it. Um, it's either an insect or a small reptile. I, I think it's an insect, though. Uh, but if you look at an insect or a reptile on a much larger scale, that would be this fire-breathing dragon. The um, thing that's amazing to me is a lot of people, they struggle with something like the Bible so talking about a dragon and think, well, that's just fantasy. It must be symbolic of something. They don't want to take it literally. Uh, dragons are also mentioned in the book of Revelation. but And they, they also say, well, you can't take literally the, uh, the, the flood and Noah's Ark. You can't take literally the uh, Jonah being swallowed by the whale. You know, those, that's just symbolic for something and, and uh, to teach us something. It's allegorical. And yet, if you ask them, well, what about the first verse in the Bible? Do you believe it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you believe that? Oh, yes, of course. Well, my question is, which is harder to do? To create the heavens and the earth and everything, all of creation, to do that, or to uh, separate the red waters of the Red Sea. Or to cause a, a flood and, and an ark. All these, these, these are nothing. They're tiny little minuscule things compared to what God did in the first verse of the Bible. Before I go on, what's your response to that? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, um, we have an amazing God. He can do anything. You know, what's impossible for us is possible for God. He can do anything. Create, create the earth in seven days, rested on the seventh. Um, you know, these um, other things that you've talked about, yes, they're nothing in comparison to creation. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with that. I love what Stephen just said. It's like... It is amazing what our God can do. Like, and of course, you know, being able to create the entire universe, 
of course, he's not bound by time. Of course, he loved us enough to send his own son here, you know, to die for us, which is, you know, the greatest gift that we have, you know, in our salvation through Jesus, you know, for him dying in our place. But just the fact that he was able to do all that, you know, and just so easy, it's just amazing. Because, like, you look at, you know, how big this universe is, and then you realize it was all created by, you know, one God. You know, it's absolutely just mind-blowing. Yeah. How easy is it for God? Well, he just speaks it into existence. Let there be light. And that's and it's created. Um, all right, let me go on here. Um, verse uh, 26 in the KJV says, The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the habergion. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Slingstones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharks, sharp stones are under him. He, he spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not like him, not, not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. I want to read that last verse in the Amplified, verse 34. He looks on everything that is high without terror. He is monarch over all the sons of pride. And now, Job, who are you who dares not dare, who, who does not dare to disturb the beast, yet who darest resist me, the beast creator? Everything under the heavens is mine. Therefore, who can have a claim against God? Okay, so the question must be asked. Uh, why is Job getting this lecture? I think before I go into that, before I answer that question, uh, I think that we need to do the final chapter and then when we kind of summarize the whole book, I think that we've got to have that perspective. Why is, does Job deserve this lecture from God? What has he done that he gets this lecture? Um, before we go on to the next chapter, anything, any remarks? I think we've summed up things, you know, really good in this chapter. It's all just the exact same thing we've been talking about, you know, the whole chat time. Yeah, it's just more description of uh, this this beast and how impervious it is to man-made things. And I'm sure we'll come on to conclusion in a moment. All right. On to the final chapter of Job. Uh, only 17 verses here. In the KJV first, it says, now that's God's been lecturing Job now for several chapters, giving Job perspective. And now Job answers God. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered what I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wow. Wow. Uh, I'm going to uh, read that in the Amplified, but it's um, that verse 5 is uh, he seeing God. To what degree can he see God? We know the Bible says no one can see God and live. And uh, we talked a lot about that in other studies 
you cannot see God in his full glory. That's why Moses was told not to look at God's face, but walk by and see his, you can see his hind part, but not, you can't see the face of God or you'll die. Uh, let me read these first five verses in the Amplified. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no thought or purpose of yours can be restrained. You said to me, who is this that darkens and obscures counsel by words without knowledge? Therefore, I now see I have rashly uttered that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here, please, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct and answer me. I had, I had heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual eye sees you. I'm loving this part. What's your response to that? Well, I think it's quite clear here that uh, this is Job sort of recognizing the Lord, verbally expressing this, that he's, he's seen and heard all these things, and he's, even though he didn't understand all of it, he recognizes the Lordship of of God and recognizes it and confesses his faith in the Lord and his reward is he's been able to actually see the Lord for who he truly is by what he's been through for his whole experience of this book yeah it's a um, I know we've talked a lot about being you know having eyes to see and ears to hear I know a lot of verses can be taken you know spiritually but you know as Job's are saying now I can see you you know with my spiritual eyes you know I like what you know you know the other Stephen said now he has a better, you know, understanding, you know, after this. You know, and of course, you know, understanding is something, you know, all of us need. But now it's been given to him, you know, by God, you know, through this lecture. Yeah. Okay, let me continue on. Uh, verse 6 in the KJV says, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And it was so that... After the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken to me the, right, the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up you for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. I'm going to stop there, verse 8. Um, I don't know if it's necessary to look at that in the Amplified. That's pretty clear, but I think that's going to be necessary to explain this further in the conclusion that after we're finished with this chapter but what's it what is your reaction to that uh, well this is um, I don't want to get I, I to go too much into the conclusion um, this is this is God talking to Job about his uh, reward for his faithfulness uh, for he, his understanding of his uh, trials that he's been through previously and I, I know these two characters that they're talking about and uh, and uh, it's about God saying to Job this is this is what I'm gonna give you for your faithfulness or part of it well, I mean what I see is now you know God turns on all the guys you know that were you know talking to Job you know earlier and now he's, you know, saying, now, you know, my anger's on you. He says, my wrath, you know, has been kindled, you know, against you. And now he's saying, you know, to, you know, give Job a sacrifice, you know, so that way, you know, I would forgive you. So now it's just like, now, like, now that he's done with Job, now he flips to them. Yeah, I guess all, all I'm going to say at this point about this is that, uh, uh, he Job has endured an awful lot of um, f 
false accusations uh, from these people. Uh, we've discussed this for like probably about 30 or 40 hours now. This what's going on here, and I, as I said in the summary, we'll I'll go through this more completely. But for now, I want to get through this these verses here. Uh, uh, so. Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she-asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karanapuch. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job a hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. Uh. Okay, uh, let's just discuss these final verses here before we try to talk, summarize the entire book of Job here. Well, I think this just shows the amazing grace that God gave the, to Job um, for everything that he'd been through through this entire book of Job and his trials and how faithful Job had been. And this was what he gave him. He gave him everything tenfold almost to what he'd lost. It's just an amazing God, an amazing thing. Just wonderful and um, just demonstration of God's love, I believe. I love it. I agree. You know, Job didn't endure through a lot, you know, after Satan, you know, attacked him. And, you know, he lost everything. And then he got chewed out by, you know, all of his friends. He went through rough times. You know, and even though Job didn't deserve it, as none of, you know, no one does, you know, God, you know, gave him, you know, showed him love, showed him mercy, and gave him back, you know, twice of what he had. It really shows, you know, how, you know the, the love, you know, the faithfulness, you know, of God, and just, you know, what he does for his children is absolutely, you know, amazing, and especially what he does for us by giving us a free gift of salvation, you know, through Jesus Christ. This is uh, this has been one of my favorite studies that I've ever done. I mean, I've read Job over the years. The first this is the first time I've attempted to really stop and really study each verse and try to understand what's going on. And I've I've seen some people recently have videos about Job or make comments about Job. Not this study, but just Job in general. And it seems like it's very common that people say they don't understand Job, and uh, it's it's a hard book to understand. Um, and I've been saying all along, I believe the reason people don't don't understand what's going on in Job is because they fail to keep the first two chapters in perspective as they go through the balance of the book. And that's that's see um, the the three friends. And then even Eliphaz, the, the fourth one, and, and even Job himself, none of them knew what was really going on. Uh, 
In fact, there, there's a verse here in the end. I, I was just looking for it, but there's a verse there I read that said the things that God had done to him, if you can find that. Uh, but God didn't do any of these things to him. Um, these people th still think that God did this to him. Uh, if you can find that verse in these final few verses here, let me see, tell me where it is. Uh, but what's really happened here is this. I'm going to sum 42 chapters up as concisely as I can. Satan goes before God and said he's gone around the world and he can't find any human being that truly loves God. And God said, well, have you, how about my servant Job? Have you looked at him? Have you considered Job? So the first thing that we've got to be aware of is that God selects out of all of mankind the one person he wanted to represent humanity. The, and he chose the very best person, the very best person he could pick out of the whole of humanity to show Satan, say, here's someone, examine him when you see there is someone who loves me. And um, so then Satan says, well, the only reason Job loves you is because you've blessed him. He's the richest man in the world. He's so blessed. You know, of course he loves you. Let me take away his blessings, and, and you'll see. He, he, he won't love you. He'll curse you. And God says, go, do it. So the thing is, God is not doing these things to Job. Satan is. That's the first thing we have to all remember throughout the whole study. It's not God doing it to Job. It's Satan. So this is, uh, it's, it's, it's not punishment from God. It's a satanic attack. Uh, the other thing is that it's not a result. It's, he's not receiving this because he's wicked. He's receiving this because he's the most righteous person in the world. So there's, there's, there, these are two things you have to keep in mind as you're going through the remainder of the book. Because Job has his, his uh, family killed his property all destroyed, his wealth, his reputation, his family, I mean, and his health. He gets boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. He's in excruciating pain and, and so sick he's near death. And all these things happen from Satan doing it to him, not God. And it's happening not because he's wicked and it's not a form of punishment from God. It is because he's the most righteous man, and it's a test. So Job gets visited from his three friends, and each one of his friends decides to lecture Job, and the lectures go on for probably 10, 12 chapters between the, all of these people, and each one of them is accusing Job and saying, you just need to repent to God because you're wicked, and this is a punishment from God. And they're very articulate, and they go on and on and on. It, could you imagine all of these horrible things have happened to you, and then your best friends come, and instead of encouraging you and trying to help you get through it, they're saying you're wicked, you deserve it, and it's all false. They don't know what's going on because they weren't there when God and Satan had that first conversation. They think God is punishing him because he's wicked. And then Job is defending himself, saying, no, I'm not wicked, I'm innocent. I'm innocent of all charges. And then Job even goes on and, and says, these are all the good things I've done. And we learn in one chapter, Job truly is the greatest man in the world, one of the greatest men of all time. He was absolutely pure. He, just, he did not, not only good things all the time, but he only had good thoughts. So we can see why God selected Job of all people in the world to be tested. He was the best example of a good man. And then the fourth friend, young man comes and he says, well, Job, you, I've been listening all this time to everybody telling you you're wicked and you deserve it, and all this time you're saying you're innocent. 
So you know what you're really guilty of? You're guilty of, of accusing God of being unjust because he's assuming God is punishing Job and, and Job is saying, I'm innocent. Therefore, God must be unjust. And so, again, the fourth friend is under the wrong impression that God is punishing Job because of his wickedness. So none of them understand what's going on. Not even Job understands what's going on. None of them were there for the original meeting between God and Satan. Finally, we get near the end here, and God comes and tells Job, gives him perspective, and says, Job, you're just a mere man. I'm God. Uh, don't question, don't question me. God never even explains to him. There's nothing in the story that that we ever conclude that that Job is finally told the truth about what happened. That God didn't punish him. It was Satan. It wasn't because he was wicked. It was because he was the best man. Job, as far as I know, never was told that. I don't know. But God, in the last few chapters here, is giving him perspective and saying, "Don't, don't have any doubts, Job." And all the while, Job would not curse God. God, he never lost faith in God. He never stopped loving God. He would not curse God. But he did question, it seems unjust what's happening to me because I'm innocent and this is happening to me. He thought God was doing it. So he, he probably thought God was being unfair to him. And that's, that's the only thing that he, you could find fault in Job. So that's a summary of the whole thing. Let me get you to respond to the entire book, however you see it now. Um, well, I think you pretty much nailed it on the head, to be honest with you, Brother Luke. And I, I'd just like to draw a conclusion about what you said about being, you know, Job seeing it as he being unjustly accused of these things. I agree with that. I see that as a parallel, really, of where we are today and how we see things today, we see things as unjust, we see things as unfair, we can see things like maybe uh, through Job's eyes or how he's feeling at that time because we don't have this knowledge of Jesus Christ in our life. It's once we get to that knowledge of Jesus that our eyes are open and we realize you know, we're not being treated unfairly or unjustly and uh, we, the scowls fall off our eyes like dragon scowls. Yeah, like, without Jesus, it's pretty easy to be um, blinded to certain things like that. But, like, yeah, Job was a, you know, great man, you know, greater than, like, well, greater than I'd ever be, or probably any of us as a person. But, you know, and, of course, it's kind of an honor to be chosen as, you know, the best guy to go through all these, like, through all these trials and, you know, everything that he went through. Yeah, and it's just amazing. He never cursed God. You know, he never stopped loving him. And, you know, proved that, you know, that God's argument towards Satan was true. You know, that, you know, he is his, you know, faithful servant. But, of course, you know, after, you know, in the middle of the rant, I guess it's pretty easy for him to be convinced that he's being, you know, unjust. You know, after all of his friends are just getting on him and then he starts, you know, defending himself. I guess it was pretty easy for him to get that mentality. So God, you know, quickly, you know, silences it. And then afterwards, still, you know, blesses him after all this. So, but still, all in all, God is still a loving and amazing God. And, of course, the gift that he gives to us, though, through salvation, through, you know, faith alone and Christ alone, is the greatest gift, you know, of all time. And it just really just shows how much God loves us. Even, you know, when how small we are or, you know, how rotten or sinful we are, he still loves us. And that's just amazing. Yeah, so um, I liked your, your both of your comments. Uh, Job, um, he he did he was not privy to everything that happened. That's why he didn't understand, and and we have to keep that in mind. Sometimes things happen in our lives, and we're not privy to everything that's going on behind the scenes, and maybe some kind of a uh, you know a, a spiritual battle that's going on. Scriptures say that we are in a spiritual battle with, 
we, we don't know. Maybe God is working things out in our lives, too, in some ways, and, and uh, we just have to trust God. And the scripture says, uh, lean not on our own understanding. We don't understand everything. We, the scripture says that we see through a glass that's not clear. Someday we'll see clearly. Uh, but I think that uh, Job was given perspective in the end by God. And what we should get from the book of Job is perspective about our suffering. Now, think about the suffering you've had in your life. It, it, it's, it's probably pretty rare to find anybody who suffered to the degree that Job did. He still loved God. He still had faith. He never renounced God and cursed God. And look what he endured. Uh, the suffering I've gone through in my life pales compared to Job. It gives us perspective. Uh, let me get your final remarks on this. Yeah, all of us go through, you know, some type of, you know, trials or some type of suffering. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, all of us are sinners. And no matter, you know, how good we think we are or, you know, no matter, you know, what we might try to do to justify ourselves, we're still always going to come up short. You know, even Job, you know, God's greatest example was that way because even he still had, you know, some flaws. Like, you know, like sometimes even though he, let's say, in general did a very good job with, like, his thoughts – and, you know, with his actions, you know, he still sometimes, you know, started to think he was being, you know, treated unjustly. And, you know, just like, you know, all of us are sinners. But, again, it still just goes to show, you know, the grace of God, you know, that we have. And just the gifts that, you know, God's willing to give us and the mercy he shows to us. And it's just beyond amazing because none of us deserve the mercy that we have. But he gives it to us anyway. And it's just pure love and grace. I agree with Brother Stephen. I think it does, uh, you know, show us how much, uh, you know, Job suffered during during the book of Job and what he went through and all the doubts and things that happened to him. Um, and when he came out of that, like Stephen said, with great uh, faithfulness and, as you said, Brother Luke, with, uh, he was the most righteous man, uh, one of the most righteous men in the whole Bible. And the parallel for us today and what we know today is that we can compare that the suffering of Jesus on the cross and what he suffered for us and how we can relate to that and understand what he went through because we have this wonderful example in the Bible of Jesus and what he did for us now to give us a free gift of salvation. Okay. Uh I guess I want to say one thing that really stands out to me about the book that I really hadn't thought of or wasn't really even aware of. Over the years of studying the Bible, um, I, I've learned that there's um, there are varying viewpoints about parts of the Bible. As you go through the Bible, um, is, is salvation uh, consistently the same throughout the Bible? Uh, some people say, well, there's all these dispensations, all these different periods through of history. God works with man differently, so there's different ways of getting saved. This was called dispensationalism. Uh, and I held that viewpoint for probably 25 years. Uh, I no longer hold that position. I, I, I think it's clear, I've done a lot of videos on this, I've done various playlists extensively showing that that's wrong, that God has always offered salvation to mankind throughout all of history the same way, by the grace of God through faith in God, not by personal merit. The only thing that's changed is, is how much we knew about God, how much over through the scriptures, we've learned more about who God is and how he would go about redeeming us. And the Old Testament, talk, throughout the Old Testament, it, it talks about this Savior that would come and that would die for us. And, and, and now they looked forward to that Savior. And then we got the division at the cross. Right at the cross is where time was divided. 
you got people look forward to the Savior. Now we look back and say it's finished. He died for us. He's, he's our Savior. But it's always been the same way. We're saved apart from our own efforts, simply by trusting God to be our Savior. And now we know that God, our Savior, is Jesus Christ who died for our sins. And so as I read Job, I, I, under, I knew that this is the way it worked, but I was so happy to see that revealed in the book of Job. There's one particular portion in particular I want to re-mention. Re Job's talking about he was saved because of his faith, not because of his, his goodness. And he also made a statement. He said that all of his sins, God had placed them in a bag and sewn it shut. And that's uh, that's a, that's an illustration of what God's done with our sins. He's taken our sins and he cast them as far as the east is from the west. Our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. So Job understood that salvation comes by faith in God and trusting Him to deal with our sins. We're, we all sin, but He'll He'll forgive us and forget the sins because of our faith. That gets us to this final message here that we want to we will not neglect ever, and that is the good news that salvation is a free gift. And Brother Stephen really looks forward to this. I want him to take a few minutes to explain the gospel, to tell you what the good news really is, that salvation is offered to all of us as a free gift. Brother Stephen? Yeah, I know. I look forward to doing this, you know, every single night. Well, and of course, Luke just turned on his profile picture. I'm sure he'll mention this after I'm done. But as a course, as per usual, I like to start off with my favorite verse, John 3.16, which, as I call it, is the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that just shows the amazing love of God. You know, God sent his only begotten Son, you know, the eternal God, you know, from the beginning mightier than any one of us, came here in the flesh and died for us, was buried, and rose again, you know, as the ultimate sacrifice, you know, for our sins, because what we do isn't good enough. And that's laid out in, you know, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. As it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, as men, we're all sinners. No matter what we try to do, we're never, ever going to be good enough to please God on our own. What we do on our own is always going to come short. We can try to be, you know, as good as we like, you know, have, we'll try to live the good life, try to do all the good works we want to do, and, you know, even in his name. But the thing is, whatever we try to do will always, let's say, come up short. You know, as it says, you know, in Romans 6, 23, you know, for the wages of sin is death. You know, which is, but the good news is found in the second half of that verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, Jesus gives us the free gift of salvation. You know, as it says, for the wages of sin is death. You know, a wage is something that, like that you work for, like in your job. It's like something that you're paid. But, you know, a gift is something that's been paid for you. You don't, let's say, it's not something you deserve, but it's been given to you. You know, and the glory goes to the gift giver. And that gift giver is Jesus. You know, who is, you know, God's eternal son, you know, God in the flesh completely. You know, Jesus came here in the flesh in the form of a man. He did what we couldn't do. He was sinless, he pleased his father, he performed many miracles. You know, he did what we couldn't do. But most importantly, he died on the cross. Let's say the sacrifice the only acceptable one for our sins. He died on the cross, was buried, and then three days later he rose again. And of course when he did that, he proved who he was and he proved he had the power to take back life and that he had control over life and death. And of course, he promises us everlasting life if we believe on him because he did the sacrifice for us. As it says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And Jesus is not going to ever revoke his promise. To back this up further, as it says in John 6:29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, 
that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. You know, remember, it's nothing we can do. On our own, we can't save ourselves. Only what Jesus did can save us. And, and that happens when we put our faith and our trust in him alone, not ourselves or anything else. Of course, more good news about this is actually that once you're saved, you're always saved. As it says in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And this is Jesus talking about all those who have believed and trusted in him. So that's the good news. We couldn't do it, so Jesus came and did it for us. He came, he died, was buried, and rose again, and he offers us the gift of eternal life, and we'll just trust him and put all of our faith in him and him alone, not in ourselves or anything else. And we have eternal security in him because of that. So that's the invitation I give out to everybody tonight, is that you'll come to Jesus and believe on him and have everlasting life. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Well done. And I'm sure everybody understands now that uh, we don't go to heaven because of our own efforts. We go to heaven by trusting Jesus and believing in who he is and what he's done for us and believing that he is faithful. He promises you get eternal life if you trust him. And because he's God, he cannot break a promise. So that means when you believe on Jesus for your salvation, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> that should put a smile on your face. All right, um, Brother Stephen and Brother Stephen, thank you for joining this broadcast. And I, I hope uh, everybody can join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.